Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, may we please present WebGLT. So uh, welcome to Cronus's Birds of a Feather session for WebGL here at GDC. Um, is anybody from Mozilla here? Jeff Gilbert in the audience? No? Okay. Basically, anybody from the WebGL working group, would you please you know, come up on stage or make yourselves known so that you can be harassed by the other audience members after, <laughs> afterward. Uh, so uh, my name is Ken. I am the chair of the WebGL working group. May I please introduce the other uh, members that are here? Um, my name is Brandon Jones. I work with Ken on uh, WebGL in Chrome. Don't forget me. You also work with me. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> And I work with Mo, but you know, I try to forget that. <laughs> I work with Ken and Brandon on WebGL and WebGL 2. Yeah, I'm also on Google's uh, Chrome GPL team. Uh, and I'm Dane Jackson from Apple. I'm on the WebGL group. <laughs> and spec editor. Okay. So um, we will only uh, briefly introduce things. We're starting a little bit late. Great presenters, some awesome content for you. Uh, but we figured that we would show you our uh, demonstration of transform feedback, which is a new feature coming in WebGL2 from SIGGRAPH Asia. And maybe Brandon would like to demo it because he did most of the work on it. Yeah, so um, as I recall, we actually, Im we actually demoed a um, slightly different version of this last year at GDC. And so it may not look too much different, but um, the actual implementation has come a long way since last year. And uh, we've got this particle system going here, which I believe is running at uh, half a million particles. And that's just to be really conservative so that it runs on um, a slew of different hardware without you know, destroying it. Um, but it is using transform feedback rather than texture loops in order to do the, the particle. And that enables some really nice complex simulation like this, where uh, we're doing collision in the shaders, um, and you can do, you can also do mouse-based collision um, that breaks it apart or, you know, touch on a, a touch screen, but um, it gives you a really good idea of, like, the complexity of scenes and interactions that you can do with uh, transform feedback and some of the more advanced logic that uh, WebGL2 allows you to do in the shaders. Hey, Brandon, was that the camera or a leap motion? Uh, that's the leap motion. So um, we are basically fixing bugs, uh, both in the implementations and in the conformance suite to try to ship this new uh, level of functionality to you, the developers. Um, and it's been a long time coming, but we're, we're getting close. Uh, I don't have percentages of pass rates for you right now, but um, we are really actively working on getting all the tests into Chromium's commit queue so that like, we get them passing and then never break them again. And the minute that we're passing 100%, it's on in Chrome. So. Anything else that we should ask, uh, should discuss before we pass it off to the next presenters? Um, not specifically. Okay. Um, when, when we're going to ship. Real soon. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so who's the next presenter? You don't want to say anything about 3.0? Uh, later. <laughs> Offline over beers. Okay, but we are figuring out, you know, the, the next uh, evolutionary step beyond, uh, beyond WebGL2 and ES3. So. Uh, Dave Evans from Play Canvas, please. Nice to be here again. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about basically the last year since we were here before and you know what we've done and, and where we've seen WebGL being used and, and really called it going mainstream because of just the kind of mainstream uses that it's not this niche sort of technical thing anymore that, um, that some people will still think it is, but it, but it really isn't. Um, for those of you who don't know what Play Canvas is, uh, we're an open source WebGL game engine or rendering engine. Um, and we also build uh, an online hosted tool for doing sort of scene editing, asset pipeline management, um, material editing, all that sort of stuff. And it's real time collaborative, so you can work with people anywhere in the world and preview it live on your device. And it's awesome, and you should go and check it out. Um, <clears throat> but that's enough about that bit. So, so some of the things that Play Canvas has been used for, or WebGL has been used for over the last year. Obviously, games is a, is a big one. Um, sadly, we can't talk about some of the really cool games because they're not out and they're not, being, they're not public yet. But um, on playcanvas.com, we've had 5.7 million plays of WebGL games. 
Uh, and that's just on playcanvas.com, right? So, um, you know, hundreds of, of applications of WebGL games produced over the last year. Um, and so it's, it's really good to see that. And, and it's really taking the place of what people use for casual sort of browser game development and stuff. Um, one of those games, a lot of that, those plays is from this game, Tanks, which I can't show you because the network's gone again. But um, Tanks is a game that we've developed in-house, and it's a real-time multiplayer tank game. So uh, playable on any device, drop in, you're instantly <coughs> playing against 15, 16 other people. Um, Tanks.playcameras.com, it's worth having a look at. And, and a, a good proportion of those 5.7 million plays come from people playing tanks every day, all day. So <laughs> It's not quite what I meant. Um, <clears throat> advertising, another, to be honest, a place we didn't expect we would be when we started Play Canvas, but one of our biggest use cases, um, and the, the biggest, one of the biggest places we see WebGL used. Uh, so this is a kind of small sample of some of the things that that were created over the last year. Um, the European launch of Ride Along 2. Um, we did a game, a drag racing game, you can see in the top left there, where uh, people got into go-karts and they raced go-karts and they were racing on the big screen with a WebGL game. Um, those two on the right, they're both in Piccadilly Circus in London, they're for Samsung. Um, so we did campaigns with a digital, agen digital agency in London. And the reason you're using WebGL there is because you have it running on your phone in the hands of people on the street, and you have it running on the big screen, and you really have all this kind of cross-platform uh, loveliness that the web does so well. And then in the bottom left was, they said it was the world's biggest game of Space Invaders. I'm not going to question their claim, but that was on the big screen at the Cannes Advertising Festival. Uh, and they had the controller on your phone, so you go to a URL, you have the controller and playing the game there. And also gives a good, nice uh, spread of the graphics from you know, the 2D up to the 3D. Um, WWE, we did a mobile campaign with those guys. Um, uh, and it looks a bit like that. So that was cool. I'm going to skip forward because otherwise I'm going to be here forever. Um, visualization, the other big part of, of what we've ended up doing a lot of, where product visualization stuff. Um, so this is a BMW i8 um, rendered using Play Canvas physical, physically based shading, uh, I think there's a custom car paint shader on there, and we've got the whole interior, exterior. Um, and so this is, for us, is kind of like the future of car configurators on the web. You no longer have to do stuff as a bunch of static images that you just sort of um, flick through. You can have really high quality renders of, um, of this sort of stuff and change the color on that. Question? Yes. Uh, do WebGL developers get a discount on a new i8? <laughs> <laughs> we did want to put a buy button in the bottom there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then this <clears throat> sort of, I guess, almost the other end of the scale, I don't know, but this is one of our customers who, who do product visualization for furniture, bathrooms, fridges, microwaves, all kinds of consumer electronics, all kinds of stuff. And, um, but, you know, really beautifully rendered stuff. Uh, and so features, new features that we've added over the last year or that we've added this week um, or announcing this week. So the first one, the physically based rendering, we, I think we showed off the first sort of pass of it here last year where we had it working but we didn't really have the tool flow. Um, so now it, it's in great, uh, integrated completely into the editor. You can drag and drop cube maps. It runs the pre-filtering for you. Um, you can configure all the materials in the engine, uh, in the editor. Uh, it's like the full workflow for this. For these and these features that you know, Unity 5 and Unreal 4 are, are introducing in their latest version, and we've got running in a web browser. And I think it's amazing. Um, so this is uh, a demo we built again internally. I hope this is local, so it should work. Yeah. Um, and so this is using a lot of the physically based rendering. It's also got um, volumetric fog and um, a couple of other things. Uh, oh, dynamic LOD of some of the, the meshes. Um, and you can fly around. Oh, no, you can't fly around. Uh, you can sometimes fly around. <laughs> 
Uh, and this runs all on a tablet as well and mobile devices. So, um, uh, again, it, it's the awesome cross-platform nature that lets you, lets you do all of that stuff. Uh, box projected cube maps is something our graphics programmer taught me about. Um, it's, it's used in this demo here. Basically, we have the cube map for doing the lighting. So all of the lighting here is, is based on this cube map, doing the image-based lighting. So you, so you can see the, the realistic reflect, you know, the, the lighting in the floor there. But um, you can also do this cunning um, sort of correction to the, when you're doing the reflections here, where you correct which bit of the cube map you're drawing based on the surface that you're reflecting. And you get really kind of decent, realistic reflections for you know, a reasonable amount of GPU time, and it's a, it's a very cool trick that, um, that we're using here. So again, this is all in, in the engine. Um, asset streaming, it's kind of tangentially related to WebGL. I mean, it's more the web part of WebGL, right? Um, you can't just um, drop people a 150 meg binary file to download and expect them to actually load it. Um, so this, in this, this demo loads after 800K, but there's about 200 megabytes of assets sort of in the back end that get loaded dynamically as you click through. And we do, um, we do low res texture, high res texture. Um, and so we load in stuff just as you need. So it's really useful, for, again, for, particularly for mobile. Uh, as someone was just saying to me, not, you know, not everyone has all the data in the world. And so you want to be able to scale that back for, for some of those users. <coughs> Uh, and then this is the new feature that's coming out this week, which is runtime light map generation. So the first thing a new user does in Play Canvas is they load it up and they stick in 100 lights, and then they run, wonder why it doesn't work. Um, because you can't do uh, deferred rendering easily in WebGL 1. Um, so, so we were kind of trying to work out a, a good solution to get around that. And, and what we've come up with is is uh, runtime light map generation. So all the lighting you can set up in the editor, you can mark it as baking, baked lighting lights. And then when the app starts, we bake all the diffuse lighting and the shadow maps into textures. Um, and so essentially you get this light map generation stuff, but you get it very cheaply. You don't have to download hundreds of megabytes of textures. Uh, and it takes, I think this scene, it's two or 300 milliseconds to bake the lighting. Uh, and you can see a quick comparison between with 43 lights, and when we can only really do seven on a mobile device in particular of actual dynamic lights, and it runs like crap. Um, and then you enable light maps, and everything goes back up to 60, and it's wonderful. Um, so that's coming out this week. Uh, should be, by the time we get home from, uh, from GDC, uh, it should be launched. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we did, uh, which I don't have time to talk about. So. Mobile texture support compression, instancing, uh, real-time asset editing, shader chunk API to let you do stuff. And then finally, a bit more that came in this morning. Uh, actually, I already have it loaded. Um, this is another demo of the light map generation stuff. Um, so this scene has no dynamic lighting and runs really smoothly on my integrated graphics card. And we've kind of got sort of fake bounce lighting done in the bake. And it looks lovely with the sponsor scene. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I got one right now. Mm. How big is the engine minified? 135 kilobytes. Well, um, <laughs> which, uh, that doesn't use MScript in that, obviously. Uh, um, not for the engine. Where, where are you guys going with WebGL2? You started on R&D with that? Uh, we're really looking forward to it, particularly for deferred rendering and stuff like that, which is something loads of people want. Um, our graphics <laughs> guys are always researching stuff, but it's kind of above my pay grade. <laughs> so. Um, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're really excited to see it land, so we're looking forward to it, but nothing to show as yet. Other questions? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the material system, is that all built in engine here, or is, do you have a pipeline from other tools? Uh, so we, gen uh, generally speaking, we use the FBX SDK to do a lot of that stuff. So we import stuff through FBX. So if you've got materials 
baked in, uh, done in your FBX, we will try and get close to that. Um, with the physical system, it's a bit harder because everything's a bit different, so you generally will set up stuff, but we will do our best to kind of make something, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, so I'm Alban, co-founder and CEO of Sketchfab, which is a, a platform to publish 3D files. Uh, in a nutshell, we have, we have close uh, to 700,000 3D files on the platform today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick update of, on our latest features and just demo a few uh, use cases um, that happen uh, over the, the course of the year. Um, so yeah, that's just our, our general gallery. And you can publish, we support 28 native 3D formats. You can publish to Sketchfab from most of the free software. We are native in Blender and Photoshop and uh, Modo, a lot of tools. Uh, we have add-ons for Macs and so on. Uh, and so one of the big stuff we just shipped, so we shipped it in uh, September, I guess, was animation support. Uh, it was our most requested feature. And so now you can uh, upload FBX files uh, and so, yeah, display animations uh, right in the browser. And so I'm just going to show you a few cool examples of how it's used. And so you can have, you can have several animations in the same file, and, and we will have a little uh, animation menu. So here there is only one. So here is a, a Tesla, for example. And you can control the, the animation timeline, which is pretty cool. Um, Quick animation demo. Uh, another very nice one is this guy. The boat's faster than that sea graph. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> right. And yeah, it's been, we were wondering if, if that many people were going to upload animations. And <laughs> actually, a lot of people upload animations. Um, so now we kind of need sound for, for this sort of stuff. Um, so last year at the, at the meetup, we announced we just got uh, integrated in, in Facebook. And since we are at uh, GDC, I just wanted to, to do a quick overview of, of how we work with games. Um, so hundreds of games have, have joined the, the platform since our uh, Facebook integration. And a lot of the games uh, actually just use Sketchfab to tease part of the game even before a game release uh, in a Facebook post. I managed to load that. Um, so here, for example, that's an asset from uh, Dying Light as a game from uh, Techland, which is a, a Polish studio, I guess. Um, it's <laughs> right. Anyway. <laughs> it's coming. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's fake loading. It's high res 8K textures. So. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Um, so, quick little animated car. And what's really cool is that I post it on Facebook. So, I'm not going to reload it there. Uh, just a great way to tease the game um, through their social channels. There's a cool example here, uh, War of Warcraft, starting to, to post Sketchfab fan art on their wall. And so you have this cool little character w walking in your, inside your, your newsfeed. Um, and then the other big thing we started working on is uh, VR. And so we just chipped a, a VR button right in the player, so you can see it here. So it's meant for mobile uh, VR right now, so mostly cardboard. So if you click from desktop, it will tell you to open the URL um, on your phone. It will straight uh, open uh, yeah, our VR mode, so it's really like one click to VR. And so we've had like crazy stories, like um, uh, I guess a month ago, there was an earthquake in Taiwan, and, uh, and a guy used uh, video footage to make a a 3D uh, preview of, of Taiwan after the earthquake, and then it was uh, published on Sketchfab. And it means that pretty much the same day you were able to walk through the streets of Taiwan uh, in VR straight from a, um, a web embed on the web. This is super slow. I just wanted to show that. Uh -huh. I should do that. Um, 
Okay. Um, so would Sketchfab work better? No. Yeah, sure. so I'll try here. One million bullies, it's a rather large file. And it's all uh, annotated in 3D, we have 3D annotations. Um, it's Do you know how, anything about how they captured the scene? Yeah, it's, it's video footage. Uh, do you, uh, how, how was the scene captured? So uh, it's video footage from a drone um, and then photogrammetry on the, on the video. So it's, it's actually pretty, pretty good uh, quality for a, for a video. Yep. Did, did this assist with rescue efforts? Can you repeat the question? Did, uh, I didn't hear. Did it help with rescue efforts? Did it help with rescue effort? Uh, I am not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, to be honest. Then another uh, crazy use case we had is a, is a surgeon performed a surgery on a, on a baby heart. And they use Sketchfab like, to, to view the heart in VR with a cardboard to like, skip the 3D printing process and have a better view of the heart. And yeah, it was just an amazing use case as well. Um, and last thing I wanted to show you is that we did some experimental 4D support with GoPro. Um, and so they have an experimental rig of 50 GoPros that will take 50 videos stitch them together and make like a, a video that you can walk inside um, and publish that to Sketchfab. It's a very heavy format, it's one mesh per frame. And it still runs pretty smoothly in the browser. Uh, and Tim is the, works at GoPro and is the, is the guy who actually builds the, the 50 GoPro rig. Uh, so it was a, a fun uh, experiment. That's it for me. I'm, my name is Trung Le, uh, and this is my teammate. Uh, I am Trai. Uh, we are a master, couple of master students from the University of Pennsylvania in computer graphics. So we are here today to talk about a project that we, we, we have been working on, which is the WebGL2 samples pack. Um, this is an inspiration from, very similar to Christoph. Um, oh, sorry, can you do it, please? Yeah, yeah maybe you okay. the mic. Uh, that way people can hear you over the web stream. It's live stream. Oh, okay, I see, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so our project is very similar to um, the OpenGL samples pack. Uh, we're really excited to, do, to work on this. Um, there has been a lot of new features coming out to WebGL2, such as the transform feedback that um, Brandon did a demo on. There's a uniform buffer object, um, the vertex array object. So, um, his um, Shrek is going to do a quick demo of um, our samples really quick. So let's take a look at the live demo. Um, you can see the page layout the same as the 3GS example page. And there's a bunch of list of samples here. We can do some easy click and view. So this is a sample showing the new draw instance call in WebGL2. And um, this is a super simple sample to tell you uh, how to use the multi-sample frame buffer object. It gives you an intuition of how does it look like. Um, so if there's a bunch of sample like this, like this is the texture LZ, and this is a sample showing uh, the new GLSL flat and smooth interpolators in the new ES3 shaded language. And one more thing about this sample is that um, the models are in GLTF format, and it's loaded by a GLTF loader that is our future focus for our project. So go out, go to the repo and check more details about the GLTF loaders. Um, so now let's do some learning, dive into the code. This is a transform feedback. <laughs> yeah, this is a transform feedback in WebGL2. We can get rid of the memory copy and uh, during the simulation process. So that's very useful. And simply click on the resource button that will lead you to our GitHub repo. and. Uh, lines that are directly related to these feature will be highlighted. So this is very handy. Our samples are straightforward, easy to understand. 
and you got the source code, you can even do some copy paste and modify thing and immediately apply it to your own projects. Yeah. So yeah, um, we are very just very simple, easy to understand, understand samples. Uh, I hope you guys go and check it out at the tinyurl.com, the webgl 2 samples. We're looking for. Yeah, we uh, encourage any um, feedbacks and contribution to this open source project. So finally, let's. Just yes, any feedback will be very helpful for us. Um, but yeah, so we just want to say thank you a lot to uh, Patrick Cozy to be our advisor. Um, also, Christoph for helping us with um, the samples. Ken has a lot of help, and um, uh, Mo, Brandon, John, Matt, and Mr. Du for like help and inspiration also. But yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Hi, I'm Tony Parisi, and I'm here with Patrick Cozy. We are the uh, spec editors for GLTF, the new runtime asset format for GL-based applications. Um, so there was a situation in WebGL for several years where there was no easy way to get content into a WebGL application. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the details of the WebGL API, WebGL doesn't actually load files. There's no such thing as, you know, I loaded OBJ into a WebGL application and it just works. The way you do it is you actually um, have an engine like 3JS or one of the other engines you use and it has to read those files and load them. And what we were finding for several years was that people were building their WebGL apps, and, you, and other people in the room know this intimately, you would create a new content pipeline every time you did that. You maybe would export an OBJ file out of Blender or something like that, and then have to sort of stitch everything back together. You know, if you had a full scene, you'd take your multiple objects, export them, and then maybe get on the phone and talk to your tech guy and tell him where all the transform positions were and where the light values were, where the can, you know, two cans tied together with a string, right? And so, um, we decided to start looking at a way to efficiently transfer entire scenes into WebGL applications. We had a, we had a, um, a file format called Collada for several years that is standard, standardized by Cronus as well, the same working group that Patrick and I are part of. Uh, but Collada files are not well, they, they represent all the data well, but they're not well suited for online transmission. They're not small files, they're based in XML, they take a lot of time to process. So we decided we need to work on an efficient format that would bridge the gap between the content creation tools, say Maya or Blender or anything like that, and WebGL and eventually mobile and desktop applications. The current focus of this work, GLTF, is on WebGL, but it's been designed to also be able to work in OpenGL ES with a little bit of modification and OpenGL for desktop with a lot more modification, but we haven't gotten to that yet. And the idea behind this is to create, essentially, a JPEG for 3D so that anybody can export from any tool and then WebGL-based applications can import the data. And it's a lot of data, um, and it's represented nicely compactly in typed arrays. Does everyone here know what a typed array is? So that's binary data. So all your big mesh data basically loads directly into memory once you've downloaded it you know, via uh, AJAX. And uh, then a JSON scene descriptor that sort of wraps it all together. And we tried to represent as many features as we can coming out of the DCC tools. Again, we didn't want to get in the situation where you had OBJ files exported individually and then have to string them back together. So um, GLTF can represent entire scenes of objects with all the full you know, mesh data, skins, animations, and shaders. And I'm talking about a few technical details in a minute. Uh, it is not tied to any particular engine. So that all, the, all the engines that use WebGL right now, such as 3JS, Babylon, we're going to talk about that in a minute, can load GLTF files. Even non-WebGL uh, applications can load GLTF files by reading the JSON and the binary data. Um, and we've actually created an extensibility mechanism as well because our group here has, we, we know we haven't thought of every feature that's going to be uh, coming down the pike in graphics or even for GLTF itself. So um, from the get-go, we've allowed for some extensibility. So that is the world of GLTF. In a little more detail, uh, basically you have a JSON file that uh, describes the position of all your objects, the, you know, the meshes in your scene, the animation data in your scene, uh, translate, rotate, scale animation, your skins, um, as well as uh, camera position, so you can do the camera projections, right? And that's pretty much it, uh, and, and shaders, by the way, GLSL shaders, which are referenced as external URLs. So you get the scene description file, and then everything else is either stored in the GLSL source file or in a .bin file, a binary file, where you're loading your typed array data. Um, and you can even actually put those together into one package through an extension, so you just have one payload. If you want to develop a web app and not have multiple requests to your server, you can actually put everything into a single package as well. Um, we have full support for shaders, so basically anything you write as a shader program in GLSL 
can be brought in and that's how you do your render. I mean, you control the full look of the scene. But we also understand that um, some folks just want to do like Fong or Blender Lambert shaded stuff. So we actually create an extension that has you know, sort of common materials in it. So if you're using 3JS and you want to just do Fong shaded stuff, you can create a GLTF export for that. And then we do you know, standard web texture formats. And you know, finally, ways to just throw in your own metadata. With a, any, any, any object in the JSON can have a .extras feature in it. Um, and we have some extensions. Like I said, we have an extension mechanism, uh, Kronos style, where we have named extensions that either come from a vendor or a Kronos itself, uh, such as uh, the KR, KHR materials common extension I was talking about. So if you know, for example, all your scenes are just doing Fong shaded stuff, you can create an export path that exports a GLTF. And if the runtime can load that extension and knows it, it will use that. If not, it can uh, actually use the shaders to shade everything. Um, plus, there's other ones. There's a quantization uh, extension that's being contributed by the Web3D Consortium. So there's folks over there. Uh, these are the folks that do the X3D standard uh, that have been working on quantization and compression techniques and packaging up assets together. So we're working closely with them. And we're also working with the MPEG group on some real uh, mesh compression stuff. So the base spec for GLTF doesn't have compression. Uh, but through this extension, we're pretty hopeful we're going to get to some really good compressed data pretty soon. I'm going fast only because we were running a little behind, guys. Um, so who, who here has used 3JS to do their WebGL development? Yeah, so that's kind of the most popular library out there for doing WebGL in general, although there are plenty of other libraries. And I wrote the 3JS loader for uh, GLTF, and I did a pull request to Ricardo about two weeks ago, and it's been merged into dev, and it'll go into master pretty soon. So anybody who gets the latest 3JS will have the GLTF version 1 loader. GLTF is now in version one. It was ratified by Kronos when, Neil? December? It was released in October. Released in October. We ratified later, right? When was that? December? Um, December. Yeah, we ratified in December. So it's official. It's a real Kronos standard now. Um, and you get it in, GL, in, in 3JS, but not only in 3JS. I'm going to turn it over to my buddy Patrick here, and he's going to tell you all the other tools that support GLTF. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so, I mean, the real value of having an open spec is that we're able to create an ecosystem of software, of useful tools that us as a community we can share. And in the case of GLTF, the vast majority of these are open source. So I think 3GS is an awesome example of the momentum there, but we see a lot of other prominent WebGL engines also supporting uh, GLTF. And then on the export side, uh, Blender is working on a GLTF exporter right now. It's, it's work in progress, but I hear it can already export me uh, textured meshes. Um, and then there's several uh, open source translators, so converters from Collada, OBJ, and we'll see a demo in a little bit of converter from, from FBX, from Autodesk. Uh, and then uh, there's a popular um, pipeline tool called Azimp that can import and export a lot of different formats now, including GLTF. Uh, and Kronos Group just released an RFQ for a validator. So you can take a uh, GLTF asset, put it into the validator, then it'll tell you if it's, a val if it's valid or if it's invalid, what's wrong with it. And I'll go through the details of the RFQ because certainly we'd like some, uh, some community uh, engagement there. Um, and then beyond the software ecosystem, we also have a number of sample models. So if you're writing a GLTF loader, you can use these sample models uh, to help you imp do the implementation. So you can start and just render a box, and then render a textured box, then add keyframe animations then add skinning, so you don't, so you don't have to jump into the skinning to, to start. Um, and then, you know, as Tony mentioned, there's a lot of extensions that, that are coming in for GLTF, as well as uh, formats that are embedding GLTF. And, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. Um, so on the engine front, I'll go through a, a few quick demos. So the Babylon JS has, has a, a pretty feature-rich uh, GLTF importer. And they made a, a fun uh, GDC demo for us that I'll, I'll bring up. So here's the classic duck uh, in, a, uh, in a Babylon JS scene. And you can do things like you know, turn on the bounding box. You can turn on all the meshes. So in this case, the, the GLTF mesh was loaded and then converted into um, the Babylon JS uh, mesh. And you can turn these on and off. Uh, and then while well, well, I have the browser open, another demo I'll show you. This is uh, Zio Engine uh, by Lindsay K, who also does Scene.js. And they're using GLTF as their native format. So here's another GLTF sample model uh, loaded in, using, and it's being rotated with the transforms in the engine. And the GLTF meshes are mapped to their entity system. So I can click on individual pieces and kind of jump in. So this is showing you kind of the use, a lot of the use cases of using GLTF in, in different engines. 
and then just go back to full screen. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Then in Cesium, we've been using GLTF uh, from the start and using it as our native model format for assets like satellites and aircrafts. Uh, but since we're a virtual globe engine, we're really interested in streaming big 3D data sets, such as think of all the buildings in Manhattan or giant point clouds. And we've been building a spatial data structure called 3D tiles. And in each node in that data structure, we're, we're using GLTF uh, for, the, for the model. So we've literally converted and rendered millions of, of models with GLTF. Um, then I think a, a nice ecosystem story, uh, there's a group called OGC, Open Geos Geospatial Consortium, uh, who does open standards, one called CityGML, which is an XML format for uh, 3D buildings. Uh, but it's, you know, it's big. It's not something you'd want to bring to the web browser. So a group called Virtual City Systems has converted it to 3D tiles and therefore GLTF and is rendering some amazing city scenes inside Cesium. The screenshot here is Berlin. It's 540,000 textured buildings. Uh, PEX also has a GLTF importer. Here's what I think is a very uh, tasteful representation of all the GLTF sample models uh, with their shadow and, and ambient occlusion system. OK, so the validator RFQ. So Kronos just released this RFQ, which is request for quotation. So we put out some ideas for how we'd like to build a validator, and we're asking the community to bid on it. Uh, this validator will be open source and available to everyone to use, and I think will really strengthen the ecosystem to make sure that all of our tools uh, operate together uh, and, and work well. So we're looking to do something in Node.js, where a GLTF asset goes in, and it's given a thumbs up, or we, it gets a detailed error message as to uh, why, the, why the asset doesn't conform to the, uh, the spec and the schema. And potentially some extras, like a drag and drop uh, validator, could, could be considered. Then we're also asking, our sample models are pretty representative, uh, but I don't think they cover every corner case of the spec, so we'd want to beef those up. Uh, so if this interests you, please, uh, uh, please go to the, the website link here, and the, um, the, the bids are due by the end of the month. Then on the extension front, uh, the folks at Fraunhofer, who, are, who do a lot of the Web3D work, uh, they're building a new WebGL engine based on WebGL2 and ES2015, uh, doing PBR shading from, uh, with the same shading models, Unreal and Marmoset Toolbag. And their, their plan is to take their PBR set, then do a PBR extension for GLTF. And we expect to see that uh, for SIGGRAPH. Okay, so, so finally, I mean, the success of GLTF, I think, really is about the community engagement. Instead of everyone rolling their own pipeline, we really can work together on those common pieces and then just do the things that are specific to our application. So there's so lots of ways to get involved. Uh, please bid on the RFQ. Uh, write tutorials on, on the work that you've done with GLTF. Use exporters. Uh, uh, donate exporters to, to open source. Uh, propose extensions. <laughs> Did you want to wrap up to here? Uh, we're not wrapping up because we're going to do some demos around GLTF. Cyril, are you in the room here? Where did Cyril from Autodesk go? Did I see him? Yeah, why don't you come on and set up? Well, Cyril's setting up. Um, let's, uh, let's do some Q&A. Anybody have questions about this, comments? Ken? Some, uh, I don't, <coughs> yeah. some of the uh, tools, export, whatever, have very specific metadata, like um, kinematics, um, uh, constraints, et cetera. How do you see these uh, you know, coming into engines, <coughs> GLTF systems by extensions, maybe? Question. Yeah, uh, so Ken asked for, for Ken asked for complicated metadata for things like kinematics. How do we see them coming into GLTF? So I think initially, you know, application-specific metadata, GLTF has a mechanism where you can store that in any part of the object, whether it be Anything a node. Dot extras. Um, the object. So I think that's a good place to start. And then if we do think that there's something that's not application-specific, we'd first want to propose as an extension, and then if it's widely useful, we'd do it in a core spec. No. So uh, I look at the shaders. Uh, on your slides, you say it's based, uh, the format to the spec is GLSL spec. Um, why not ES spec? Because if you specify shaders in ES uh, spec, then you may, not, you may not be able to just execute it in WebGL. I'm not sure what your question is, Mo, so can we try that again? I, I think he's asking GLSL versus GLSL ES. It's GLSLES. It's GLSLES. Yeah, the question was, is this GLSL or GLSLES? It's ES. It's, it's WebGL okay. compatible. 
Good point. I should update those slides. Time for another question? You yes. said it would be a bit more work to um, adapt this to desktop. Can you, um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, there are blending ops. There are various bits of the pipeline in uh, GL versus GLES that. Oh, sorry. Let's repeat the question. Yeah, so, you're the, gonna, you're gonna <laughs> so, yeah, the, the question was what needs to be done for GLTF in order to make it work with desktop OpenGL? So, today, some people are doing GLTF, GLTF with desktop OpenGL, and there's some open source uh, C loaders. But to take full advantage of OpenGL, we clearly would need to add more to GLTF. Yeah, it's, it's simply a lot about the GLTF architecture surfaces GL constructs into the JSON, like, you know, you're defining blending ops and things like that. So there are differences in the pipeline between ES and full GL, and we have not focused on supporting a full GL set of operations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, so this is FBX to GLTF. Um, so FBX is an open SDK, so you can, uh, you can include that in your own application. On the exporter, actually it's an exporter on importer. And it has been written such a way that you can uh, fully integrate without work from your side the exporter into your app or even on any existing app supporting FBX. So for example, if you want to export uh, from Maya to GLTF, Maya already has an FBX exporter. So with that plugin, you just plug it into Maya and you can immediately export to GLTF. No work needed from, from your side. And you did not have to export to a format like FBX on then GLTF. You just trade export um, to GLTF. So uh, right now, we support the uh, node architecture, the light, cameras, skinning. The animation stack, I still need to work on it. Uh, I have some basics working. Where I still have work to do is about the internal FBX uh, solvers, like particles, physics, et cetera, because they are proprietary to Autodesk. So I can't. And they're in C++, so I can't really export them. So right now, I'm trying to, uh, to export that to GLTF, um, uh, GSL shaders, and do some work from, from here. Um, but it's, uh, it's ongoing work. Um, so it's a slide I took from Patrick's presentation. I just changed it uh, very slightly, uh, because the way the exporter is written is that it actually can either embed uh, or have external reference on because of you want maybe to stream geometry uh, to, to your browser, you can create multiple binary files. You don't have to have a huge one that you, uh, the 3GS or Babylon JS will load, you can have multiples. And the exporter is very flexible that you can have uh, segregate um, information in a small piece or, or different way. Uh, I was talking to um, your first name, I forgot, Kelad, about uh, compression. Uh, I will support compression as well, but at the very end. I don't want to bother too much uh, right now with compression. Um, and I'm testing on several platforms to see how uh, the CFVX exporter is working. So uh, right now I'm working with Silva at Microsoft to have a better uh, Babylon JS uh, support. Uh, there are a couple of issues we, we need to fix on both sides. Uh, but uh, lately, what I did was integrate that into the Autodesk View and Data Viewer, which is um, WebGL based, but versus everything you saw until now, which is more like game and fancy uh, things, we focus on design geometry. So uh, it's more about the design on information rather than graphics uh, on animation. So I want to show you as uh, if you on data API viewer uh, at the very end. Another thing, uh, before I forgot, um, FBX can read almost any, um, let's say, game asset format, such as uh, Colada, OBG, etc. So with this exporter, uh, you can export OBG, Colada files using that exporter too. Um, so it will be a single pipeline to leave, uh, to say it uh, simply. Um, so this is what I said at the beginning. So uh, FBX can read all this on a couple of others, uh, and you can export that to GLTF, but the plugin 
can be put into any FBX application. So Max and Maya are FBX application. But if you have your own, just drag and drop the DLL into the FBX uh, extension folder on you can export to GLTF. I actually export on read GLTF uh, because it's a read on it's an import on export plugin. So two two components. Um, so there is a command line tool on the there is the IO FBX runtime extension. So that's the one you would drop in Maya, for example. And the command line tool is really just to read command line arguments on putting uh, uh, parameters, but it just do nothing. I can show you the code, it's like one file. Uh, every intelligence into the uh, second uh, component. And I do support uh, all platform, all the major platform, Windows, OS X, Linux. I have actually tried on iOS too, it's working, but I don't really see a need for that yet, so I haven't published it. Um, I, I, I tried on Babylon GS, 3GS, on the view on data API. That's where you can find the source, and I have also a website where I'm going to push, let's say Friday, um, the compiled version so you can download it without having to build it yourself. Um, so what I want to show you, so I, I just started, I just exported the doc because I saw it was quite popular just before. Uh, so it's, it's very quick to, to export. And this is the Autodesk uh, large model viewer. So for this asset, it doesn't really show anything special. But uh, if I go to this one, uh, which is uh, a lot larger, you can see that I'm loading the uh, GLTF file in, in the Autodesk viewer. Uh, and what is nice with that is uh, I'm, I'm working on developing a debug tool for GLTF. Uh, because one thing I'm, I'm facing as a problem is FBX file is so widely open in terms of SDK that people uh, do things they're not supposed to do with the FBX SDK. Uh, one example typically is FBX support layers. And you can have layers a number of layers, and you can turn them on off in the application. So for example, someone may have one layer with a diffuse texture, and then a second layer with a diffuse texture as well. And then which one do you want to see? Um, and usually normals are on layer zero, and that's how it's been designed, but actually you can have uh, normals on any layer. So how do you read that and export that uh, to GLTF? So I have some configuration uh, formats that you can drive through parameters, uh, as well as it reads by default has Maya and Max would, would read them and export them. Uh, but, okay, so this one has been exported and uh, you can see that it did export well, the textures, material, lightning, everything is, is there, uh, but because I want to have a debugger and I, I want to understand how the GLTF was exported, uh, you have this tree where you can navigate through uh, the nodes uh, in the scene and you can turn on off different components. And ultimately you would get uh, information about these components, what they are, what the geometry is, what material is defined. Um, and Someone gave me an idea, uh, was it Play Canvas, who made like, you can do some editing online. Uh, so maybe I, I, I'm thinking now, maybe I should have some kind of editing so I can turn on a few things as well. So that gives me a couple of ideas. And uh, because we have all the structure, uh, yeah, let me show you with everything on screen. That's the last thing I want to show. Because you have the structure in GLTF with nodes and etc., you can actually explode things. And you can select items, you can turn on textures, you can, that would be a, an editor that you can really leverage. Um, and since it's not targeting games, uh, this editor is, uh, is pretty handy to, to debug the information in the GLTF file. That's what I wanted to say. Um, so I just published a code, uh, version one yesterday, and this is it.
Yeah, so do I have an online drag and drop uh, website where you can do conversion as well? So if you go here, it's not yet working, but it will next week. Uh, we'll this is. The URL up later. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, gltfautodesk.io, that was on the last uh, page. Uh, and you would drag your OBG, DAE, whatever file into it, and it will be translated automatically. Yeah, so um, so can we have an auto automated tools which automate translation without to do it manually each time? Um, yeah, I'm, I haven't shown that, but actually, because I want to do regress testing on everything I'm doing after release one, I'm developing such framework where every time I submit the code, it goes through all the testing automatically. So you can probably adapt that to to do uh, your pipeline. I'll be around if you have any other questions. Uh, okay, so um, I'm also from Autodesk. Uh, my name is Nop. I'm a WebGL developer uh, with Autodesk for about two years now. And uh, we're working on a new project uh, called Pro Project Play. That's not it. Uh, this guy right here. Um, and uh, we're invited to talk because we are using GLTF uh, fully in production, and we've been loving it so far. So we're just going to share some of our experiences with uh, what, what, what GL, uh, sorry, GLTF, uh, some of the advantages that we've been uh, using, um, and our experiences. So to give you some context first, uh, Project Play is uh, very, very young project, uh, in, currently in development, team of three, very small team in Autodesk. And what it is is an online web-based, 100% web-based uh, 3D authoring platform uh, without using any code. So um, you can wire up uh, nodes and building blocks. So it's sort of like building with Legos. Um, so just to show you what the interface looks like. Um, so this this is what our our engine looks like. Um, so you can see down here that uh, these these are the building blocks that you're interacting with. So it's sort of like a visual coding language. And the goal is you know you can build any online three experience without writing you know three js or hiring some programmer uh, to build it for you. Um, so we can do. Like from just a simple s model spinner to something more interactive. Uh, there's sound, uh, plays video, uh, video textures, um, PBR mater materials, things, Headphones. all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, these are just some 3D buttons that you can totally hook up in the, our system. And also, because we're on the web, we communicate with all sorts of API as well. So uh, this is just hitting the weather service and also um, Google Maps to get some coordinates and uh, real data coming through, driving uh, 3D behaviors, uh, so on and so forth, right? Um, OK. No, do not close. Um, yeah, so just to give you a sense of what, what all this uh, looks like. Um, so it's very simple behavior, what's driving this cow? Here, uh, that every time I click, he changes his materials. Um, so the editor, he, uh, th this panel here is something you're fam familiar with, like uh, in Unity or uh, in editors. Uh, what you see is what you get. So you can change the position, um, things like that. But uh, don't have too much time. So um, just to give you a ba basic idea, so every, every time you click the, this, this model right here, uh, it, it fires some events. Um, this goes into a counter. Um, the value is increasing from one, two, three, and that is going into another uh, node that switches my materials. That's um, it's just something simple. But OK, uh, on to how we're using uh, GLTF. Um, so 
GLTF is our primary runtime format. And the first thing we love about it is the streamability of it. So this headphones uh, model is about 15 megabytes, uh, very high res. Um, but it is it comes in as one file, and as you can see, if I reload, you see parts uh, popping in. Um, well, it's cached, so let's try to do a empty cache. See how fast our internet is. There it is. So now, now, it's, now it's, re it's really streaming. So it's, um, it's not fully loading the, f the file yet, but as soon as it loads a part that is a, a single geometry, or actually part of a geometry, it, it pulls it in and displays it in the engine right away. And uh, we also don't just stream individual parts, we also stream uh, parts of a large mesh as well. I don't want to show this in real time because it might take a while, but this is uh, our friendly St Stanford Dragon um, in GLTF um, streaming in as a single file uh, by the single mesh. So as soon as uh, geometry is ready, we, we put it on the screen so you, you can have it. Um, the other thing that we love about uh, GLTF is the uh, hierarchy. And because we're a node-based editing system, it plays beautifully with the rest of the engine. Um, so this Beats headphones um, comes in, I did not, well, I, I hooked up some materials properties so that you can uh, adjust the colors on the fly. So I put some logic in there, but, oh, and also uh, a folding animation. Um, but besides that, all of the nodes here are prop populated from just reading the GLTF file. For example, um, this is, as this hierarchy on the uh, right, left side here is as if it would appear in Maya, right? So I have my left, the left side of the headphones. I can come in here and right now it's hooked up to the animation, so I can't tweak it, but uh, let's see if I can find it here. So there, we have an animation editor that is driving the, doop, no, left, right, fine. Okay. It's not showing the curve for some reason. That is a bit buggy, but OK. It's, it's playing something, but I don't see the curve. <laughs> but um, trust me, that is there. But if I unhook this, and I can come in here and tweak. So you know that's, that's just all part of the hierarchy, right? And let's see, three minutes left, maybe. Uh, I'm going to show you that this is real. So I didn't, I didn't make this. So I'm going to uh, just start from scratch with a new scene. and drop in my uh, GLTF loader and have another corny what, uh, engineering art scene that I prepared in Maya. And I'm, I'm just going to drop it in. And we have a friendly bunny sitting on a chair. Um, and you, as you can see, everything is, again, streaming in. This is one file. This is not multiple files. And it's just uh, native GLTF. Um, OK, so what can I do here? Uh, open this up, and you will see that this is now pre-populated automatically with the data coming in from the GLTF JSON. And because uh, we're a node-based software, we can, let's say, um, interact with this directly. Um, so this is the chair. If it were a separate piece, I wouldn't be able to move it. Um, let's say we have put some animation on it. So I'm going to click on the bunny. Oh, sorry, it's this one down here. OK. Uh, it's firing some events. I'm going to hook it up to an animation, uh, a spinner kind of node. Oops. So it's going to, every time we click on it, it's just going to spin once. So it's just a simple demo. And once we hit the bunny, we say begin. Start, and now every time I click, it spins. So that's just to, to give you an idea of how GLTF is just playing along with our system so well. Um, yeah, and I'll stick around, and mingle, but uh, that's all I have to show today. Questions? Yes, of course. I have a question. When are you releasing it? 
Um, we, when, am I re when are we releasing this? Uh, in about a month, we're going to go out with alpha. So if you're interested, send me an email. Yes? What's left to do? What's left to do? Uh, lots of things. <laughs> um, so our graphics engine is um, in-house. So we, it's not really up to speed. Um, we have you know, PBR and all that good stuff. But you know, as you can see, we don't have shadows yet, something like that. Um, we're still lacking uh, skin animations. Um, and there's just a lot of usability type stuff. It's very rough on the edges. But we're, we are planning to uh, do some alpha round in about a month. Yeah. Yes. And who are your main target customers? Uh, who's, who's the main target customer? Um, currently, we are uh, a publishing pipeline for, so currently, as of Friday, we'll, we'll be going out with the first uh, portion of this platform, which is a publishing pipeline, and to another product called Autodesk Memento. If you would like to learn, this is not a sales pitch. I'm not. <laughs> uh, but we have a session at 3:30. It's a reality capture software, and we're at the tail end of that. Um, so that's about uh, you know museum curators. Th those those are the targets. But this is for any type. You know the audience here is the perfect fit for this as well. Um, anyone who wants to create 3D content. Uh, on the web, yep. And you know, we're 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 more targeting less for games like the Play Canvas guys, but more for you know some lighter um, demo, like three chance demo type uh, stuff. Yeah. All right, no, great. Thank you. Uh, so you want to know uh, more about uh, GLTF? That's the three D formats working group at Kronos. The GLTF spec is live. It's all on GitHub. The spec itself. Um, so if you go to the Kronos repo on um, the, the Kronos account on GitHub, you'll see the repo for the spec as well as uh, 3GS sample loader and a couple and a lot of sample models. I uh, would love to get your involvement in that. And thanks for listening about GLTF, Ken. Um. It's really incredible to see how the uh, GLTF ecosystem has bloomed in just the past year. I mean, it's, this is staggering to see the support. This is really like the first time that you're seeing broad-based support across multiple tools, multiple engines, you know, for a file format that is not only export, but also import. This is tremendous, and, and it's just great to see what you guys have done. Um, so uh, we're really over time, so please stick around, have some more lunch, uh, chat, and uh, great to see you all. Thank you for Thank coming. You.